Professor Rensberg has published a uh, number of, of things on uh, pieces on chiasmus, uh, including the redaction of Genesis, um, which we're going to hear, imagine something about today uh, in, in Professor Rensberg's presentation, uh, as well as an article on redactional structuring and the Joseph story in Genesis 37 to 50. Uh, so with that, turn the time over to Professor Rensberg. Thank you very much, uh, Jacob, for that lovely introduction and uh, my um, warm um, wishes to everyone here and especially to Professor Jack Welch, who has invited me to participate in this conference, my third visit to BYU, and it's always wonderful to come from, oh, maybe 30 or 40 feet above sea level in New Jersey to see the beautiful Wasak Range overlooking uh, Provo, so um, it's always great to be here, and I think. Uh, all the organizers, it takes a lot to put a conference like this on, uh, and it's always wonderful to see it all work so smoothly. I guess 9 a.m., first thing in the day, is a great place to talk about the book of Genesis, right? Because that's where the Bible begins. Um, so if you have the um, conference program, um, my handout pages begin on page 24. And I'll be projecting all of this on the screen, but I can't project on a horizontal slide, uh, right, the entire vertical page that you get in the uh, handout. So I'll have to be dividing it up. So to get the full effect, I'll want you to have a look at the, um, the handout um, pages, as I said, starting with page 24 uh, as we proceed. So I published a book called The Redaction of Genesis in 1986, first book I published. And then a second edition came out in 2014, a few years ago, at a distance of several decades. The, the book itself was unchanged, but there's a new forward, uh, an extensive forward in the second edition. And I flesh out some ideas that probably uh, that have percolated over the um, intervening years in that uh, forward to the second edition. It's a lengthy, substantive forward. It's not just you know two pages of thanking a few people. So. Um, I'm, what I'm going to do today in half an hour is summarize a book. Now, it's a relatively thin book, but let's uh, proceed in that direction. So um, we're going to do, focus mainly on the three uh, patriarchal stories, which is to say the Abraham narrative, the Jacob narrative, and the Joseph story. If you want to know what happened to poor Isaac, we'll talk about him in a moment. There's no cycle of stories about Isaac in the, in the book of Genesis like there is about his father Abraham or his son uh, Jacob. So if you look at page 24, the first half of which you see here, the uh, Abraham cycle, I'm calling it here chapters 12 through 22, but as you can see from the first um, uh, unbolded line, it actually begins at the end of chapter 11 with the genealogy of his father Terah, which uh, closes chapter 11. Uh, and it goes from chapters 12 through 22, and you can see the structure A, B, C, D, E are the five main units which bring us from chapter 12, or technically the end of chapter 11, through chapter uh, 16, the end of chapter 16. At that point, we have the focal point of the narrative. I guess I should show you the next slide, because you, which is the second half of page 24 in the, in the uh, program. You see it unwinds E prime, D prime, C prime, B prime, A prime, with all the units matching perfectly, right? So the same themes that occur in units A through E then occur in reverse order from E prime uh, through A prime, with the genealogy at the end of chapter 11 uh, as a bookend matched by the genealogy at the end of chapter 22 as a bookend, right? After the near sacrifice of Isaac, which is the culmination of this narrative, you then have a genealogy. What's that genealogy doing there? Uh, it's of, not of his father, but of his brother Nahor. So you get this uh, bookending by the two genealogical units, which is to say even the begats of the Bible, right, have a place in this structure. You know, don't skip over that material, as, you, as I'm trying to uh, indicate for you. The focal point, right, the place at which the first five units and the second five units meet uh, is the beginning of chapter 17. And here you have three crucial items which come to the fore in the narrative structure of um, the Abraham cycle. First, he gets his name changed from Abram, in units A through E, he's Abram, to Abraham in units E prime through A prime. 
in that first five, in those first five verses of chapter 17, the name of God changes in the first units, the first half of the Abraham cycle, we only have the name Yahweh, the four letter uh, name of the Hebrew tet tetragrammaton, yod heh vav -He, anglicized as Yahweh. And in chapter 17, the other name of God is introduced, Elohim, it doesn't appear earlier. And the third uh, item there, which is new, is the covenant, the covenant, the central aspect, right, of the Jewish biblical tradition, the covenant between God and the people of Israel is the focal point between, uh, in the middle of the Abraham cycle. Now it's true, as you can see here, that covenant is already mentioned in unit E in chapter 15. Uh, and that's because it will serve as the bookend uh, to E prime where you have to have covenant as well. But the covenant in chapter 15 is not described in such um, elaborate terms. It's mentioned the real covenantal agreement between God and Abraham is actually in chapter 17. And so that to me is the focal point. Name change, introduction of another name for God, Elohim, and the introduction of the covenant in much larger terms in chapter 17. So that's how the Abraham uh, cycle unfolds in a, chiastic, um, in a chiastic structure. Now you'll notice, just to give you a couple of um, items here, that in units, I'm flipping back and forth, but you can see it all on your handout again, page 24, that in units E and E prime, you not only have the covenant, but you have the annunciation of his two children. Annunciation, the technical term where God reveals himself to the mother of the forthcoming child, or, the, or actually father or mother, the parents, either, either direction. So in chapter 16, it's to Hagar uh, that Ishmael would be born. And in chapter 17, it's to Abraham with Sarah in the wings that Isaac uh, would be born. Um, notice that it is the enunciation of these two forthcoming children which forms the central point here, not their births. In the ancient Near Eastern tradition, the birth itself is typically told in very succinct terms, and she gave birth to a son or something like that with the proper names there. Um, we know this from Ugaritic, ancient Canaanite uh, epic from Ugarit, where the Annunciation scenes take prime, um, prime role in the narrative, and the birth is almost an afterthought. So the biblical tradition is part of that, right? So I can't match up for you the birth of Ishmael in 16 and the birth of Isaac in chapter 21. Uh, what I can do is show you that the Annunciations match up, and that, of course, tells us something about the way the ancients, including the Israelites, thought of this material. And this is throughout the Bible, by the way. If you go to Judges chapter 13, um, the angel reveals himself to Samson's mother, uh, unnamed, she's an anonymous character. That is a whole chapter of Judges 13, and the birth of Samson is only narrated in the last verse, right? There would be another example of that. Similarly with Hannah at the beginning of the book of Samuel, right? There's a big lead up of a narrative about leading up to the birth of Samuel, and the birth is narrated very quickly, but the lead up to that. So this is all part of the tradition, hence the Annunciation scenes are uh, prime and central here in units E and E prime. Now, I was trying to figure out how do I do some visuals here? I love archeology span and I'm always putting stuff up when I do that kind of work. Um, I'm basically showing you words on the page, on the printed page, so I just want to take a moment here to remind our, ourselves that although we read the Bible in English translation to be sure in a printed book and even in Hebrew in a printed book, that these uh, words reached us through the work of medieval scribes, ancient and medieval scribes. And so I'm just going to, just for the visual effect, occasionally have manuscripts up there from uh, the Middle Ages. The abbreviation CUL stands for Cambridge University Library, which has one of the great repositories of medieval man Hebrew manuscripts. And uh, they all have very complicated class marks or shelf marks, uh, as they're known in the UK. Uh, so here's just one beautiful example of these manuscripts. So there's, just keep your eye on them. And I will have something to say occasionally about them. A whole other field that I work in is the field of medieval Hebrew manuscripts of the Bible in particular. Uh, and um, um, I have had the privilege, the honor and privilege of spending time in both Oxford and Cambridge and, and reading their manuscripts. And again, I was there this uh, summer. Uh, these are all available online, by the way, at jewishmanuscripts.org. You could do it from the comfort of your own home. It's free. Just don't tell my dean that, who supplies me the research funds to go to Cambridge to actually read these things and spend a summer in England, OK? Or the taxpayers of New Jersey. Don't tell them that either. Okay. 
So what I thought I would do is show you the way units match up, right? From the Abraham cycle, I'm taking unit B and B prime, uh, because those are key stories that everybody knows. In chapter 12, unit B, God tells Abraham to go forth, the Hebrew expression lech lecha, and in chapter 22, God tells uh, Abraham again, lech lecha, go forth, and this time uh, to go sacrifice Isaac. So the um, units just don't match up thematically writ large, that is to say big theme of unit B and big theme of B prime, or as I said, genealogy bookend is A and genealogy bookend is A prime. What you wanna do when you look for chiastic structure, right? if you wanna look at the criteria, is that you wanna get more than that. You wanna get actual lexical items and individual minor themes that match up together, themes, motifs, and so on. So I'm using B and B prime for the next few images here. This is not on your handout. Uh, to give you a sense of how they match up. Uh, in chapter 12, God speaks to Abraham for the first time. In chapter 22, he speaks to him for the last time. So there you can see how those are going to be this envelope with the, with the, um, with the genealogies on either side, and then all the story unfolding in the middle. Uh, item two here, the lech lecha, the go forth, the only two places in the Bible where this expression occurs, the entire Bible, not just Genesis or the Torah, the entire Bible. Uh, in both of these, number three here, Abraham does not know where he's going, right? He doesn't know the destiny, the destination point, right? Go to the land that I will show you or to the land of Moriah. Of course, there's a name there that I will point out to you. In chapter 12, verse 1, God tells Abraham three times, notice the word you are, right? You're going to go from your land. He's leaving his hometown in Mesopotamia. From your land, from your birthplace, and from the house of your father, threefold. When he tells him to go sacrifice Isaac, right? It's not just go sacrifice Isaac. It's your son, your favorite one, whom you love, Isaac, right? So the threefold use there of uh, the pronoun you or your. Uh, in chapter 12, he goes to the Terebinth of Moreh, a auditory echo in chapter 22, as I just mentioned, to the land of Moriah. In both of these, item six, he builds the um, altar and the blessing which occurs at the beginning of chapter 12 in, in unit B and at the end of chapter 22 in unit uh, B prime. Uh, you'll get auditory echoes like Makom Shechem, the land of uh, the place of, of Shechem in chapter 12, verse six. And in chapter 22, you'll get the word Makom place and the verb with the same three Hebrew root letters, coincidentally, it's not lexically or grammatically related, but Vayashkem means to get up early uh, in the morning and he arose. So you're getting these sounds that appear uh, in the two units um, as well. Another beautiful manuscript there for you, and of course reminding us that they don't always come to us uh, intact, but they, uh, as you can see, have uh, holes in them um, for the ravages of, of time. God appears to Abraham, I mentioned that in both of these, number nine here. Uh, number 10, at the end of chapter 12, oh, that should say 12, nine, not 22, nine. At the end of chapter 12, uh, in that unit, he goes to the Negev, and in chapter 22, he goes to Beersheba, uh, English Beersheba, the largest city in uh, the Negev. Both stories unfold in two stages, both unit B and B prime. And we're gonna come back to that point. And for a really wonderful long range um, alliteration, alliteration is usually when the words are right next to each other or near one another, but here you have a long range alliteration. My last item here for you, item number 12. In the um, Genesis chapter 12, unit B, uh, the narrator uses this verb vayatek, uh, and he proceeded, an unusual word to journey. It's not he journeyed and it's not he went, the usual Hebrew verbs for those of you who know Hebrew, nasa or halach. But this is a very unusual Hebrew word. Why did the story use this word vayatek there? Because it needs, the author needed a auditory or uh, alliterative echo with a rare word that appears in chapter 22, uh, Vayakod, and he bound, he bound Isaac on the altar. You can see and hear the same sounds uh, in these two words. And in the latter one, chapter 22, verse 9, Vayakod is in fact a hapax legomenon. We heard that term yesterday, a word that appears only once in the Bible. It's right here. And the author did not use other Hebrew verbs to bind or to tie the verb kashar being the most, exact, most common word to bind or to tie, but he selected this rare word, so he got two rare words, one in chapter 12, 
um, one in chapter 22, a unique verb, and put them there in those units so that you, the listener to the story, can hear this. And rem let me remind you that these stories were not read silently, they were all read aloud, right? There was no such thing as silent reading in antiquity. Somebody held the text, and a, a manuscript, and an audience, maybe this size, smaller, larger, whatever, in some sort of setting, uh, heard the text being read uh, aloud, both in its original setting and then eventually when you move into uh, liturgical settings within Judaism, uh, the synagogue, or within Christianity, the church, although there it would have been done uh, in Greek in the earliest church, Greek or in Aramaic. So there's the Abraham um, cycle for you. Now let's point out um, some other items concerning the Abraham story. Uh, the documentary hypothesis, um, to which I do not subscribe, uh, holds that chapter 12 is to be assigned to J, the Yahweh source, and chapter 22 is to be assigned to the E, the Elohis source. But how can that be if the two sources are using the same language and the same words and the same themes? This, to me, bespeaks a single narrative voice, which, for lack of a better term, if you needed an abbreviation, I would call N, N for the narrator, a single narrative voice, not only for Genesis, but to my mind, uh, the entire Pentateuch. Scholars also think that the end of chapter 22 is a secondary addition, right? That this was added later on, but it can't be because as I indicated a moment ago, both chapter 12 and chapter 22 have the story unfold in two stages. So the second stage of chapter 22 has to be integral to the story. And the comments by great biblical scholars like Robert Davison and Gerhard von Rad are simply, in this case, off the mark. And there's part of that secondary edition, and there's the manuscript showing you where it, where, it, where it is included. And you can see that the units are necessary at the latter verses of chapter 22, verses 15 through 18. By the way, I put not so in parentheses. I was going to put it like a big knot, you know, like a 12-year-old like a, like a might say. But uh, I thought, no, okay, just do not so. And uh, you can see that the blessing at the beginning of 12 is echoed in the end of 22. So the last verses of the story in chapter 22 are not a secondary edition. Uh, they need to be there for the story. That's all part of the integral material. After chapter 22, there is still more material about Abraham. It's not that he dies at the end of chapter 22. If you know the book of Genesis, right, you have in chapter 23 the death and burial of Sarah. You have the obtaining of a bride for Isaac in chapter 24. Abraham's death isn't until chapter 25. But I exclude them from the Abraham cycle because they are miscellaneous material. And I remind you that they are to be excluded because the last time God speaks to Abraham is there at the end of chapter 22. This is just closing, you know, winding up affairs uh, for Abraham, and they are excluded from the Abraham cycle in the way I have um, uh, interpreted the material. As I said, there's nothing about Isaac. There's no, I shouldn't say that. There's no Isaac story, because Isaac appears either as a son to Abraham, as he does, for example, in chapter 22, most famously, when he's bound on the altar, uh, or as the father to Jacob, as he appears most famously in chapter 27, when Jacob uh, obtains the, uh, the blessing uh, which was intended for Esau. So um, the Jacob cycle is the next major unit of the book of Genesis, and it starts here in chapter 25, and the key work here was done by Michael Fishbane. Uh, on the handout, uh, if you turn to the bottom of 24, you can see that there were other people who already worked on uh, uh, the Abraham cycle, including Professor Radai, whose uh, pathfinding work in chiasmus we'll talk about uh, this evening, but the, um, and then I did much more of it in my own book. For chapter, for the Jacob cycle, go to page 25, the work was done by Michael Fishbane, then of Brandeis University, uh, now of the University of uh, Chicago in his book, Text and Texture, and then I just incorporated and expanded upon his work in my own uh, book, The Redaction of Genesis. So you get the same structure here, units A through F, and then, next image, but you can see it all on page 25 at once on the, uh, in the packet, uh, units F prime uh, through A prime. And the focal point is, at that point in the story, Rachel, as you know, has been barren throughout, the favorite wife of Jacob. When she gives birth, in chapter 30, verses 20 through 25, her birth, giving birth to Joseph, leads to Jacob's decision to return from, remember, he fled Canaan to go live with his uncle Laban in, in the land of Aram, and then he makes the decision to return to the land of Canaan, uh, the promised land. That's the focal point where the whole story turns, units A through F, and then F prime through A prime, and you see it all laid out for you on, in the handout. 
as all of this is again developed in a chiastic structure. Um, units C and C prime are the ones I have chosen here to show you uh, on these images as to where the um, units, just again take almost at random two units, in this case C and C prime, where the same themes that appear in unit C appear in, uh, which are basically chapters 27 uh, and chapters 33. My favorite of these is, I'm not going to go through it in the same detail, my favorite of these is uh, item number four here, because in chapter 27, Jacob steals the bracha, the blessing from Esau, by deceiving his blind father Isaac, but he gives the bracha back to Jacob in chapter 33, right? Isn't that a beautiful where the brothers are reunited peacefully? And in that case, bracha doesn't really necessarily mean blessing. I've glossed it there as gift, right? It means a gift. The same Hebrew word is used for a blessing or a gift. And that's just a beautiful thought unto itself that should resonate with all of us in this room. Uh, the kisses, right? So you have all of these same, and again, item number seven, similar words that are being used here, right? The same vocabulary items. Uh, a manuscript image, just to remind us that not all of them are written by professional scribes. This one is written almost amateurishly, right? This is my handwriting almost that you see here. And on it goes. A key word that appears in chapter 27 is the word sa'ir, meaning hairy, because you all know, you all know the story, Jake, uh, Esau was hairy. And that happens to be the name of the mountain, Seir, where the descendants of Esau, the people of Edom, will live in the Mount Seir. Right? So these are, uh, again, you know, these echoes of the same sounds, of the same words, and as I said, the same themes and the same motifs that appear uh, in unit C and C prime. And I'll just have to move forward here a little bit because of the uh, time constraints. Uh, there are two doublets in C and C prime. In unit C, there are two reasons why Jacob flees the home. One is that Esau's anger, after learning what happened, uh, that he one day will come after Jacob. And the other one is the desire of his parents, Isaac and Rebekah, that Jacob should not marry a Canaanite. Those are both there in the story. And scholars have said, well, these have to be from two different sources. Uh, they can't both be accurate, and one reason or the other, but they can't have two reasons why he fled. Um, of course, we all know the fallacy of such a comment. Uh, and in, in the unit C prime, there are two reentry points for uh, Jacob back into the land of Canaan. And I've indicated those here by the two arrows, right? One to the city of Sukkot in Transjordan, and one to the city of Shechem um, in, in the land of Canaan proper. But I think the two doublets are there for reasons, right? They sort of parallel one another, right? They're all both integral to the story, right? And neither of them is... Uh, they easily could be dovetailed or rationalized. This is not an either or, but a both and, right? They can easily have both reasons why Jacob had to flee. And geographically, he could have gone to Sukkoth first, unlike what my arrows are showing you, and then uh, crossed over the Jordan to Shechem, which is the way I would rationalize um, these two uh, points uh, of the, uh, reconcile these two points of uh, the Jacob story. Uh, there's more miscellaneous material after my entire Jacob cycle, and that parallels to a great extent the same kinds of things that you have in the miscellaneous material that follows the Abraham cycle. My most original contribution is the Joseph story. When I wrote the redaction of Genesis, I was reading all of these material by earlier scholars, Radai and Fishbane and others, and say, okay, there's redactional um, chiastic structuring to the Abraham cycle and to the Jacob cycle, let's investigate the Joseph story. And there I found uh, the material that you see here. We're now on to the next page, page 26 of the handout. Um, units A through F, again, the first half of the Joseph story. And my second image here, units F prime through A prime, the um, uh, the unfolding of the Jacob story leading to the very end, uh, to Joseph's story rather, to the very end of the book of, of Genesis. The focal point, a very easy one to find, right in the middle of the story, chapter 45, verses 1 through 4, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. We all know that scene, one of the most poignant scenes in the entire Bible where he asks all the Egyptians to leave the room and he breaks down and cries to his brothers and says, I am Joseph, your brother. How is our father? Uh, Jacob, is he still alive, right? That we all know that scene. It doesn't get more dramatic and poignant than that uh, as the tears come down and the brothers all kiss one another. The, the other brothers, of course, in shock that this is their brother Joseph serving as the vice, viceroy of Egypt. Um, again, we could look at unit C and C prime, and the same themes occur. The most important theme here is that in both of them you have a reversal, right? In unit C, 
Joseph is really innocent and uh, Potiphar's wife is guilty, but of course it's reversed. You know, Joseph is found to be guilty and Potiphar's wife is you know, pure and innocent as the story, as she, as she tells her own tale and her husband believes her. Uh, the reversal at the, near the end of the book of Genesis, C prime, is where Jacob crisscrosses his hands and uh, Ephraim, who was supposed to be, Manasseh, who was supposed to be the firstborn, becomes secondborn, and Ephraim, who was secondborn, son of Joseph, becomes uh, the firstborn. And again, similar lexical items uh, and themes and motifs. You're getting the picture here by now, including the words, lie with me, uh, implying a bed, and I've just circled them for you on the image, and uh, the actual mention of a bed in unit uh, C prime. All similar material unfolding uh, and units matching uh, one another from um, the two halves of the Joseph story. I want to focus on one item here, the last one on the list, number 10. Uh, by the way, this is a great example, again, of a poorly executed text, the manuscript. Notice there's cross outs and there's stuff in the margins, a little bit like we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Don Parry showed some images of that later on, uh, earlier yesterday, but it's still happening later on in the Middle Ages. Look at item number 10. In the um, story of Potiphar's wife, when Joseph's in the house of Potiphar, the word lechem, bread, is used there in 39.6. It means literally bread or food. Joseph is not in charge, is in charge of everything in Potiphar's house except for the food, the bread which Potiphar ate, no doubt due to different dietary laws between G Egyptians and Israelites. But it's also used figuratively there as a euphemism in ancient Hebrew to mean wife. In Genesis 48.7 in C prime, the author weaves into his text the word Bethlehem, Beit Lechem, literally in Hebrew, house of bread, but of course it's a place name. And Jacob is describing where he buried Rachel. And he says in Hebrew, um, it's always good to hear a little Hebrew on a Wednesday morning, right? The Ekbarasham Bederech Ephrat He Beit Lechem. And I buried her there, he's recounting the death of Rachel earlier in the book, and I buried her there on the road to Ephrat, which is Bethlehem. Right? No human being would speak that way. Right? If I told you that I came here from you know, New Jersey, I then wouldn't say, that is, and give you another name for New Jersey. Right? A narrator might do that, but we don't speak that way. And this is Joseph's, uh, Jacob's first person voice there that is being quoted. Uh, how could he speak in such a way? But the word Bethlehem is integral to the story because you need the word lechem, bread, to evoke and link C prime unit to unit C, which the story listener would have heard long ago. So for me, this is not a textual problem. This is built into the narrative uh, tradition. And there's those Hebrew words from this manuscript page, also in Cambridge, although it has a different um, shelf mark. It doesn't have the C-U-L with it. I would argue, as I said, reading what I just have said, said here, that the term is integral to the narrative. Contemporary scholars often impose their own logic on an ancient text instead of letting the narrative logic of the Hebrew composition speak for itself. And the attention to the chiastic structures that I'm showing you here demonstrates how you're supposed to actually read one of these texts. The words which is Bethlehem in Jacob's voice are necessary to make, make another linkage between C and C prime. Moreover, again, the documentary hypothesis fails us as it does so often, because Genesis 39 is supposed to be J, and this verse in Genesis 48 is supposed to be P, but this is all thought out in advance by a master architect storyteller who actually needed all of these words to have all of his units um, linked together. I end with quoting the words of my teacher, Cyrus Gordon, who himself made several visits to Brigham Young in his own um, um, uh, academic career, and who was actually the teacher as well of our now retired colleague here, Paul Hoskison. Gordon would never say that such and such a scholar was wrong. He divided scholars into two types. He would say, there are those who catch on fast while others take more time. Okay? <laughs> All of us in this room have caught on fast, okay? You're in the former category, okay? Unfortunately, there are still those who need more time. Thank you.
Okay, thank you for these questions. You mentioned that the structures and parallel elements strongly suggest single authorship for not only these narratives, but for the entire book of Genesis, and you were convinced that the entire Pentateuch was authored by one person. What are some articles, books, or other resources you would recommend that would lend further support to the sole authorship of the Pentateuch? Well, let me, let me now tweak what I said, okay? I think there's a single narrative voice, right? From the creation to the death of Moses at the end of Deuteronomy. To me, there's a single narrative voice. Inserted into that narrative voice are legal cultic materials, uh, which have two huge blocks in the Pentateuch. The P, or priestly block, which I accept from the end of Exodus, all of Leviticus, and the beginning of Numbers, which is at Mount Sinai, it takes place at Mount Sinai. And it's in the, ver in the word of God who instructs Moses, it's in the mouth of God who instructs Moses to build the tabernacle. These are what the sacrifices will be like and so on. The second major block is the material in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, which we call D, which is in the voice of Moses and it takes place in uh, the plains of Moab um, not in Utah, Moab, in, in present-day Jordan. And uh, there, Moses reiterates much of the material, and that's why you get the Ten Commandments twice, and so on, and other laws which are reiterated from uh, earlier material in the Torah to the uh, book of Deuteronomy. So I think there's a single narrative voice, but inserted into it are legal cultic material P and D. I accept that aspect of the uh, documentary hypothesis. What I don't think is that the narratives should be subdivided. Right? This is just one narrative voice. Yes, there are contradictions, including the two creation stories and the number of animals Noah took on board the ark, but those are minor compared to the macro structures that I have shown today and that others have worked on uh, with other parts of the uh, Torah. As far as bibliography, uh, you can probably find things at my website. Uh, I have most of my published articles are available there. If you just search Gary Rendsburg Rutgers University, my website will come up and then look, click on complete list of publications. I wrote an article called The Genesis of the Bible. That is probably the closest place where you can see this. And with apologies for not selfless, uh, shameless rather, um, self-promotion, my forthcoming book, How the Bible is Written, will have a chapter on that. But that book won't be out till around 2018. I haven't seen uh, proofs for it uh, yet. Okay. Um, Take another one? Yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, what is the website again? Uh, yes, jewishmanuscriptsplural.org, where you can find all of these. It's free, but you need to register. jewishmanuscripts.org. There is a worldwide effort to digitalize all um, Jewish manuscripts, which basically means mainly Hebrew ones, although some are in Aramaic, uh, and aggregate them at this website. And the largest number of them come from what's known as the Cairo Geniza, where approximately 300,000 Hebrew mainly Hebrew documents were found at the end of the 19th century. The two thirds of them are in Cambridge. And then smaller, um, smaller numbers in Oxford, New York, uh, Paris, St. Petersburg, Manchester, etc. Uh, so if you go to jewishmanuscripts.org and look, click, uh, register and then click on the Cairo Geniza module, you'll be able to access this and totally searchable. You want to see manuscripts of, you know, Amos chapter seven, they'll find them for you, right? Okay. Um, and the last question is, you noted specifically the introduction of Elohim introduced at the focal point. What would this mean for the specific usage of Yahweh in the climax of Abraham's spiritual odyssey? Uh, right, okay. So um, I don't know the answer to this question. Um, for whatever reason, the author decided to use Yahweh throughout chapter 12 through 22, but introduced Elohim only there at the focal point in chapter 17. It's actually a little counterintuitive. You might think that he would have used the word Elohim throughout, because that's the generic word for God, and then have introduced Yahweh, the specific name of the God of Israel, in chapter 17. But it's not that way. Um, and I don't really know why that is. Um, so all I can say is the two names appear in the second half of the Abraham cycle, alternating side by side, whatever it is. Certainly when the blessing occurs, to ask, answer the specific question at the end of 22, uh, for there, um, it's, it's, um, very clearly, um, it's very clearly for, uh, to use the name Yahweh because that's the more specific name for the uh, God of Israel. Okay. There's, there's more? Hmm? Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, well, I don't even know where to go. Um, real quick question. The description of Jacob's first wife, Leah, what does it mean that her eyes were 
rakot, nobody knows. <laughs> the Hebrew word usually means soft. Does it mean that only her eyes were beautiful and the rest of her was not so beautiful? Does it mean that she was beautiful everywhere except for her eyes? Nobody knows. But as I tell my doctoral students, if anybody can answer that, you get an automatic PhD and you don't have to write a dissertation. <laughs> Thank you very much.